I first was introduced to Bitcoin, obviously everybody, well, almost everybody starts with a Bitcoin by a colleague of mine um, at, at um, one of my previous place of work. And we just started chatting about it at the lunch times. And I first didn't get, really get the idea, but when I did, it sort of kind of grabbed me. And I started to think about, is it possible to implement the decentralized storage um, using Bitcoin primitives? And uh, while looking at it, I actually understood that it's really difficult or nearly impossible to do. And the first idea first, like, okay, um, could I create my own blockchain, which is kind of really fantasizing about it. And then I somehow, you know, got into looking at MasterCoin, um, where actually Vitalik used to work on MasterCoin uh, at some point in, in the past. And then Vitalik published that white paper with that Ethereum, which I kind of caught my attention straight away. So I read it and then I just signed up for email address on their website. Well, I put in my email address on their website to sign up for the news and then there, there was this uh, crowd, um, what they call the pre-sale and everything like that. So I read whatever there was available on Ethereum. Obviously now it's not really possible because there's so much stuff. I mean, in the beginning, you can actually keep and you know, you can actually learn pretty much everything that was there. And so coming to this point, I'm I, th I consider myself very knowledgeable about all this kind of stuff because I've seen the history as well, how the project developed, how it went through the test net, how we launched. I even managed to mine, mine a couple of blocks and <laughs> at launch when uh, when it was uh, not very difficult. So, yeah, I think it's um, interesting to actually be part of that part of the history. People normally describe Ethereum as like a world computer or programmable blockchain. Um, uh, I've got actually, I've got the whole lecture about it, but uh, trying to summarize it is um, if you imagine the database um, as we, like a global database, which can keep, mostly it's keeping the, everybody's account, but in Ethereum it's much more general, the database can keep pretty much any data. And the difference between that database and the database we used to is that it's very restrictive about who can update it and in which way. Um, so each database entry has an ownership and only the, like only the, so this, this, this ownership could be defined by the rules, by the smart contracts, who can then update these records and the smart contracts could be controlled by only certain people. So it's a highly sophisticated um, I would say the highly sophisticated entitlement mechanism is coming with this database. And that gives this database the power that you can be certain about who could have modified the entry or could have, who could not. So you can actually reason about the state of this database. You can say that if, if, if only this particular person can update this record, then I'm kind of feeling safe. Like, or if only under these circumstances, this record can be changed. Um, so a very simple example, which we could see in other blockchains, if I, the record which, um, which, keeps, which keeps the, the amount of the cryptocurrency that my account owns, that I know that this record can only be updated by me. Right, it's, it's kind of one of the fundamental features. And of course, Ethereum extends it to the, like a more general, we're going from just a database of accounts to a database of anything. And the updating logic could be also very general. So yeah, I would say like, yeah, that, that would be my reinterpretation. I don't think if Ethereum or any blockchain technology can improve every aspect of our lives, but I think one of the important improvements it can, it can provide is that it can give you the tools to um, to kind of, when the, when, the pro, when the things go wrong, it gives you the tools to inspect why they are wrong. So uh, one of the situations which I kind of see as a curse of the modern times is that when you're dealing with um, things like with the online shops or with um, airlines or with something else like a, with the, even like a, with a bank to give your uh, loan or something like this as long if you if you if you keep within a very standard procedure everything kind of works but when you start fudging the your requirements a little bit so oh by the way i want to increase my loan amount by this 
and suddenly it becomes a non-standard procedure and things get complicated and the mistakes are made and a lot of times you have to predict what kind of mistake is this but the real problem is that you don't, know, you don't see what is going in inside this organization inside this this company which deals with your request and you can only guess what was wrong and then you have to debug this you remember you've probably been in this situation before where you have to call them and literally debug your order like say so what, what went wrong and then you got the person on the other side of the phone which doesn't who doesn't understand what's gone wrong but they they try to follow their procedures but the procedures don't work it's, if i could only see the state of your database relating to my order if I could only see what is there, I could probably like tell you what the problem is. And I had a friend who was applying for a visa in the French embassy in London, and he figured out that they had, um, let's say that you may, you have to make an appointment to to get to get to um, to go to apply for a visa, and he made an appointment, but that appointment he couldn't make it. So and he wanted to make another one because he couldn't cancel the previous. There was some issue. But he couldn't make another appointment because they, he figured out that they used the, the passport number as the key in their database. And the database did not allow him to insert another record with the same key. And he only realized it because he was an IT engineer. He knows, oh, they must be, the database must have the, my passport number as a private key, as a, as a primary key. So, but he had to solve this problem somehow. What he did instead is like, okay, what if I modify my passport number by just one digit and then just try to book another appointment? And it did work. And as long as the, the person on the entry doesn't realize that there's one, one a digit is incorrect, then it's fine. He solved his kind of life problem, but it wasn't possible to solve with the people on the phone because you just don't get it. They just, the people who answer the phone, they don't get they don't know about the primary key in the database, but this is exactly what it was. And imagine a situation where it was all, you could all kind of revealed to him, be, be revealed to him and say, okay, so here's the thing. This is where your order was, it went there, this is the database state, and this is the error. And, you know, I can see what happened. Um, it's maybe too contrived, but I think the transparency um, is probably one thing we can achieve now.